You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome to the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, you thought that uh, the light banter that we were having was being recorded, but it was I wasn't. thought it was part of your shtick. No, no, no. No, no, no. I was just commenting that I could hear my uh, next-door neighbor, Doggy Carson, uh, serenading me. Yeah. Yeah. Commenting. Yeah. Editorial comment. I'm, it, he loves the show. He's 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 you said know, many times he loves the show. Many dogs do. Yes. Yeah. Dogs will just sit in uh, rapt yeah. amazement by this show. So if, if you have a dog Play and your dog. you're yeah. looking for something to entertain your puppy, I'm not even joking. Turn on Psych with Mike, and you will be amazed at the impact and and the, you are the such a that it has on your dog. Yeah. <laughs> Because he will be well behaved, and it will probably Does change his life and yours. Children, <laughs> um, not as much. Not as well. Yeah, right. actually, children don't have attention spans that are as long as dogs. Hmm. Yeah. Well, what, small, small children. What about wives? I'm not going to go there. Oh. Because <laughs> I'm because I'm married happily and want to stay that way. Your wife doesn't sit in the corner and stare at you and tilt her head when you talk. Well, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. She said to me today, why don't you guys do a show on the fact that nobody can get anybody to work for it? Because my wife's always been in retail. You know that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I said, well, I probably don't have a lot of expertise on that. I probably would need someone on the show. I said, I, I think it's a great topic. And she's like, well, you always talk over everybody's head. I just can't. I can't listen to you. I'm like, okay. Yes, dear. So, <laughs> yes, dear. So I said, just sure. send me some information. She's like, you, you're good at research. You could research it. I'm like, okay, yes, I could. Yeah. yeah. So that will be a show that we will do um, in as soon as you get back. Okay. Because you're getting ready to leave. Yeah. For a month. Got to be somewhere. Yeah. Well, you got to be somewhere, but yeah. you don't have to be so far away. Uh, I don't have to be where it's sub-zero either. Right. I feel like that, they, that that's hurtful to me. Why, why do you need to hurt me like that? You could go. <laughs> I could go. No, I couldn't go with you and your wife to Galveston. No, but you could go wherever you chose. Yes. To go. Oh, I see. I could go separately. Yeah, I yeah. don't have any control over that. Yeah. But uh, today's topic is why do we always hurt the people we love? And the corollary to that then is why do people remain in relationships where they are consistently hurt. So one of the things this article does not mention is a factor, an ingredient that has importance, uh, is what we learn to call a uh, flight into sickness. Mm -hmm. When people come into therapy and you spend some time working with them on identifying the distressors in their life and behavior patterns and relationships, and then trying to discuss ways to get stronger or better or healthier, whatever descriptor you want to use, so that they can make productive changes so their lives are not as distressed. They will get close to the point where they see it, close enough to the point mm -hmm. where they see it, they understand it, they see the tools they need to use. They may even have developed some of those tools, but then they'll run back into the attachment. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, there's there's an opportunity close to the end of therapy where the client will will do what's called a flight into sickness and they'll run back right in as deep in the pile as they can get mm -hmm. uh, because it's what they know mm -hmm. it's what they're used to mm -hmm. and even when it's miserable it feels comfortable mm -hmm. they don't suffer the anxiety of being alone or right. isolated or out there away from the nest so then that brings up a question in my mind. Would yeah. you would you then call that a conversion disorder? No, no. Not, not as I understand the okay. term. Okay. So, um, but actually that does bring up another thing. Um, we've never actually done a whole podcast on personality disorders. Is that something you want to do? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, 
That's a good topic. But uh, so the flight into sickness yeah. keeps the person in what we call homeostasis, in a state of balance. So in therapy, they've moved to a place where they're starting to recognize that they could change some things. They've gained enough insight that they they yeah. actually could yeah. actively do that, work on that process. But then they get scared yeah. because... The fear of the known is always no, the fear preferred. Of the un- unknown is the fear of the oh, unknown. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Keeps That's what I was going to say. The pain of the known is always preferred to the fear of the unknown. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so people will always stay, in, or will most of the time stay, in even a dysfunctional, hurtful situation rather than change because the hurtful situation is homeostatic. It's right. in balance. Right. It's what you know. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you're convinced it's what you deserve. I'm not worth more than that. I don't deserve any better. Now I just want to understand it. That's why in therapy so many people spend so much of their time, unless the clinician is skilled enough to interfere with it, trying to describe other people's behaviors in their life, Mm -hmm. other people's motivation, trying to understand why do they behave this mm-hmm. way? Why do they do this? How can I create change in them? Instead of being able to say, you are the only one right. that, that you can look at and change here. Right. So as the clinician indulges that, you have to let them stick their toe in the water a little bit. But then you got to pull them back and say, well, you know, we're focused on you. So when I hear you do this, it sets off an alarm Mm -hmm. in me. And I want to call that to your attention and say, there you you go again. Mm -hmm. Uh, And say, let's come back and focus on you. Why do you stay? How do you understand why you stay? What's Mm -hmm. your motivation? What's your agenda? What's your payoff? Uh, And what could you do differently? What would that cost you? So we've talked about that staying is homeostatic. It's balanced. That's why we do it. And it's known. But it's also known because a lot of these experiences that we are in, and the reason we stay is because they mimic the experiences that we have when we're growing up. So they mimic certain dynamics in our families of origin. And that is oftentimes why we even end up with the people that we end up with. We don't consciously go out and pick people that are going to help us relive our trauma, but unconsciously we tend to do that in transactional analysis. That's called scripting. So there's a man named Harville Hendricks. Mm -hmm. He and his wife have written a series of books, conduct workshops uh, on that theory Mm -hmm. called the Imago Theory. Mm -hmm. It says that we select mates or people to be involved with because unconsciously we read their body language and their phraseology and their presentation and recognize that they present us with an opportunity to finish unfinished conflicts from our childhood mm-hmm. uh, and, and in the theory they mostly focus on the parents you know so you are looking for someone if you have unresolved issues with your mother you're looking for someone that manifests and doesn't have to be a woman doesn't have to be a mother it, it just has to be someone that behaves in similar ways has similar triggers uh, similar reactions so that you have an opportunity to re construct dialogue from your childhood differently Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of times when people fantasize they fantasize backwards about a circumstance that happened Mm -hmm. and they recreate that conversation in their mind as if they had said different things Mm -hmm. as if you know in, in a fight with your father a power control fight with your father where you just shut down and he slapped you around, called you all kind of names and said bad things about you. Uh, and you might have been reduced to, oh, yeah, huh. Mm-hmm. But in our unconscious, we will revisit that. I mean, he says this, and then I say that, and then he says this, and then I say that. And I'm brilliant, and I'm articulate, and I'm convincing. And he says, oh, my God, you're right. Yeah. I'm really yeah. wrong here. Yeah. Well, it doesn't happen that but way in real life. Happened, right. but, but we want it to. And so... In our other life, we look for people who present that way so that we can have that dialogue Mm -hmm. 
over and over and over and hopefully eventually say the brilliant thing mm -hmm. uh, and, and have it change. Mm -hmm. So it, we get stuck in traps and our lives are unhappy and our relationships are unsatisfying or so, damaging. So I'm a big, big believer in and proponent of this concept, yeah. whether it's imago theory or transactional analysis, because there's a lot of that that yeah. overlaps. What's in the name? What a rosy. Yeah. yeah. But... So, so you you agree with that premise? Yes. yes. Okay. And so w this is an unconscious process. We don't intentionally go out and find someone that can help us relive the traumatic relationship that we had with our mother or with our father in, in any other way during our development. But we unconsciously do this. And so then once we've done that, if we get to a place, so then I go to therapy and but, but it's unconscious. I mean, it's right. really important to make it clear. It's not visibly the same. No, no. And you so can marry the I same go, guy over and over I, again. Exactly. They all turn out to be alcoholics. With, yes, yeah. or, or whatever. Right. Sexual abuse sure. or physically violent or what have you. Because uh, whatever the cues are by which you learn to identify those people, they're subtle. They're mm -hmm. discreet. They're uh, individual. Uh, a tightening around the eyes, a pursing of the lips, a stiffening of the shoulders, something that gives you early warning. Okay, now we're going to dance this dance. Mm -hmm. This music is going to play. And I know my words. I know my lyrics. I need to sing my part. Uh, and so you find someone, that if you come from a particularly dysfunctional family, you go and find a similarly dysfunctional mm -hmm. family to get involved with. Mm -hmm. And it, it may not be the same operative signal. It may not be alcohol. It may not be drugs. It may be uh, politics or religion, but the power control issues, mm -hmm. the dominance hierarchies, the uh, the things that are never said, the things that are never done, uh, the patterns in the relationship are going to be the same. So you have that opportunity in the new setting because maybe your parents are dead. So now how am I going to resolve that? Mm -hmm. Well, go find another similar family dance the dance and yeah. find a way forward yeah so if a person decides that these things are not functional for them they go to therapy they gain enough insight that they're ready to change then do you ever do anything specifically to try and uh prohibit them from this flight back into sickness or what what do you what 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 do you think is important in therapy to help this person be able to courageously make the change you have to create the safe holding environment mm -hmm. so they can come in and genuinely be whoever they are and if in my distress or weakness i regress I still need a safe place to come and work through it. I need somebody to help hold me in that space until I get my strength back, mm -hmm. until I'm, I'm encouraged and ready and to take it again. And I may come up and nibble at it several times before I step through the doorway. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to need the support. I'm going to need the understanding. I'm not going to need the judgment. I'm not going to need the criticism. I'm not going to need the punishment. Mm -hmm. I need the support. And it's the job as a therapist is to understand that, do accurate, reflective listening, and say you are where you are i'm here with you mm -hmm. you know we'll go forward when you're ready when you're strong if you're not ready it's okay mm -hmm. That's like, uh, a lot of times people come in and say do you give homework assignments uh, as a therapist you know you're going to make me go home and meditate or journal or go to meetings or whatever it is and i would always ask do you need a homework assignment why do you need one you know, can you not do this on your own you're not ready mm -hmm. uh, and typically the clients who say they need homework assignments if you give them one then they come in the next week and they say, you're really going to be mad at me. Yeah. You're really going to be disappointed at me. You're really going to be upset with me because right. I didn't do my homework. Right. Well, we knew that they weren't going to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and, and subconsciously, so did they. Mm -hmm. But they felt better having that rabbit's foot mm -hmm. to take home with them of, I've got this assignment. It anchors them. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly fine if they do or they don't yeah. do it because it's, it's way. fodder for the therapeutic interaction. Conversation. Either yeah. way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's go to our break, and when we come back, we'll pick this up on the other side. Okay. You know, if you've gotten this far into the show, then obviously you find the show to be worthwhile, beneficial, maybe even helpful. And so I just wanted to say, if you've gotten this far into the show, 
and you want to help us out, even if you don't want to help us out, just do it anyway, go to <laughs> Apple Podcasts and rate us and leave a review. That is super helpful. Subscribe to the show on YouTube and hit the bell icon so that you get notifications when new shows drop. That stuff is really, really helpful for us. And I know that Mr. Brett agrees. Absolutely. Reviews are positive. Uh, positive reviews are more positive than <laughs> negative ones are as well because it helps you uh, decide what, how to focus and how to, how whatever you're attending to say is being heard. And the secret so, is the algorithm doesn't care whether the review is positive or negative. As our friend Mike Norton says regularly, feedback is a gift. <laughs> if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Okay, we're back. And so uh, we create this safe holding environment and the client is talking about either, you know, we hurt each other all the time, or I don't know why I stay. And well, so, so let's be a little more okay. specific. Okay. Sometimes when they say we hurt each other all the time, um, there are people who have learned to fight nasty. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking to you, you fat pig. You know, okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that somewhere they learned to say things like that, mm -hmm. to establish a power dominance, to wound in a particular way, uh, to have a whole prepackaged set of feelings ready to go and push the button and hand them to somebody. It's like slamming them. And they, they fight nasty. They fight mean. They say hurtful, harmful things. They bring up old wounds. So we, we have a wounding situation between us. One of us hurts the other emotionally. We cry. We break up whatever. We come back together. We promise we'll be better. We won't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And then for the next several years, every time you disappoint me in some way, I bring it up. Oh, I remember when we were in Mexico, this happened. I remember when we were in Ireland, this happened. You always do that. There mm -hmm. you go again. Uh, and it's just part of the dance that says, okay, now... I'm feeling some anxiety, some distress. I need to go back into the established pattern. I need to go back to the place where I know how it all feels. Mm -hmm. It's like putting on a pair of comfortable shoes that you've broken in. And if you're going to have to go for a hike, you want to wear shoes that are broken in. You don't want new blisters. Mm -hmm. So they they fight dirty. And you can see them. You can hear them when you go out socially. You see people do that to each other. And you're like, well, why in the hell are they doing that? Well, it's part of the dance they dance. They couldn't do it otherwise. Maybe in therapy they can learn to. Mm -hmm. But if I learn to in therapy, my partner is going to go, when I go home, is going to be playing those same cards. Here, you want to dance to that? No. Okay, well, here, how about this one? Well, here, how about that one? So that's why we recommend, if you have an opportunity, get the couples involved. Mm -hmm. Because if the odds are if a married partner comes in for therapy, if they get healthier and stronger, that marriage is more likely it's to on, end. Yeah, it's rocky. But mm -hmm. if they come in together there's a better chance that they can both grow in, in new directions together. Right, because if one person comes to therapy and they get better, yeah. they've now changed the rules of engagement exactly. with the partner. And the partner and says, the I didn't want to do this. Yeah. This isn't my idea. Right. I, I'm going to resist this because you are unilaterally doing this, and it makes the relationship less stable, yeah. even though it's yeah. healthier for that you individual. You say that to me, and I say to you, oh, no, you just don't love me. Mm -hmm. If you love me, you do this, or if you love me, you do that. Uh, it's just fascinating how the patterns evolve. There's also a, uh, a, a an underlying belief in attachment theory, and I don't want to go all through attachment theory. We could do a show on that sometime, but uh, that says that insecurely attached individuals will oftentimes use conflict at cross purposes. So one partner uses conflict as a way to create intimacy and the other partner uses co conflict as a way to create distance because that's what they were used to in their families of origin. And a lot of times those individuals will find each other and well, they'll get married. Time. Always. Yeah. yeah. And, and then one person will not, and they, they, neither one of them understand. So the person who wants to use conflict to create intimacy is like, I'm ramping up the conflict. We need to now resolve this by making love or whatever we do to be able to resolve 
resolve that and create intimacy. And the other partner's like, no, 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 no. We're using conflict to be able to get away from each other. Stop following me. Stop following me. And they, they don't understand that about their partner. And so they're working at cross purposes. And they think that 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 is really dysfunctional. But in reality, they're both playing the game that feels comfortable to them. So... You spend time trying to understand why does my partner behave this way? Mm -hmm. Why does my partner say these things? Why does my partner... And ultimately, you have to spend time looking at yourself. Mm -hmm. Looking at the mirror. What do I do that evokes this? What do I do to contribute to this? How do I change my response to it? And so it's not about them. It's not about why do they do this? Why do they always do this? It's about you. Mm-hmm. When they do this, which they always do, how are you going to be different? Mm-hmm. And what are you prepared to do? What will it take? How much mm-hmm. strength? How much preparation? How much resistance? Because the invitation to dance this dance is ingrained in you and patterned in you. And your unconscious is going to want to pull you back into it. Mm-hmm. So when you're on uh, automatic pilot, when you let your guard down, your awareness down, and you just are functioning along in the day, you will unconsciously drift back into those patterns, those statements and attitudes. You have to stay cognitively aware Mm -hmm. and continue to choose every time there's an opportunity to say, no, I don't want to do it that way. Now I'm going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And and people in your surround, people in your environment, not just that individual, but other people that know you in that relationship are going to play the same music for Mm -hmm. you so that you have an opportunity to dance comfortably. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the challenge is, again, clinically, one of the fundamental challenges in therapy, how do you get them to focus on what they say, what they do, what they feel, Mm -hmm. instead of how does my partner feel? Mm -hmm. How does my partner trigger? How does my partner, what do they want? What's their agenda? Uh, It might be interesting to know that. and Mm -hmm. It's worth spending some time trying to understand that. But if this is what they want, Where does that position you? Mm -hmm. What do you then want? What are you prepared to do or say? What will that cost you? You're always talking about the economies of relationships and what does it cost you? What do you get from it? Right. There's Uh, a payoff. So what I would wonder, because I've actually said this, not a lot, but a couple of times, uh, said to someone, I can't guarantee you that your relationship is going to survive you making changes, but I can guarantee you that that would be good for you. Do you subscribe to that? I I don't know that I ever guarantee anybody anything. Uh, I think... Guarantee might be too strong a word, yeah. Well, I think what, the way I would approach it is to say, I believe in you. Mm-hmm. I believe in your strength and your ability to make good choices for you. As soon as you see a path forward, my job is to help you marshal your resources, lay the things out so that you can pick them up when you're ready. But you won't change until you're ready, until you're strong enough. So if you have dips mm-hmm. and regressions, that's to be expected. That's okay. Just don't give up. Just mm-hmm. keep coming. Mm-hmm. We'll get you there. If you work with me long enough, we'll get you there. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's. I think that's what I would say back. But so you're saying, yes, I will get you there. What I'm wondering is, do you ever try and give the client language about what the pay, what the payoff is, what the benefit is? Um. I try to get them to articulate it without me feeding them the words. Okay. So if you were free to say, you smell mm-hmm. bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to be intimate with you right now because you need to take a shower. Uh, or I need you to take a shower so mm-hmm. that I can relax. You need to learn how to say that. Mm-hmm. And we can rehearse different ways to say it so that it's not a slam. It's not, uh, it doesn't kill the moment. Uh, it takes ownership. Uh, you, know, you go back to that little formula. When you, and you identify a behavior, when you approach me and you're unclean, mm-hmm. I feel, what do I feel? I feel 
closed in. I feel trapped. I feel uh, subservient. Repulsed. I, yeah, repulsed. Because well, what is it in my awareness mm-hmm. about me that causes me to feel that way in response to that stimulus? Mm-hmm. What I need is I need you to take a shower. Mm-hmm. I need you to brush your teeth. I need you to whatever. Mm-hmm. Change the sheets. Uh, and if you do or if you don't, what will I do next? Mm-hmm. But you don't give them the language because you believe that it's that if they come up with it themselves, then it's theirs. Is yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. so. And I think that's probably uh, true. Say generically, yeah. It may not be true for every case because... Sometimes I like to hear myself talk, mm-hmm. and so I get I get lost in my own uh, uh, self masturbatory mm-hmm. conversation because I think I'm really smart. And I'm really helpful, and I right. want to help you. And here, look how bright I am. Right. Uh, but as a clinician, that's not my job to use them for my payoff emotionally. And so my conceptualization, if I say, I guarantee this will be yeah. better for you. My idea is that people are always if you're coming to therapy you're coming to therapy with an ego strength deficit you gotta remember the basic personality of the person too i am so oppositional when you say that to me my reaction inside is oh yeah huh Mm -hmm. uh so if if i'm that person and you're paying attention to me you got you learn you can't say those things to me because i won't hear them. yeah but my ho- yeah i was going to say but my hope is is that i would know you by that well, time I and, and, my and i wouldn't well. say that but but for Don't those individuals for those individuals who are coming at that from an yeah. ego deficit and could benefit from borrowing some of the ego strength of the therapist i i sometimes think using that kind of language i would just still hypothetically approach it i would say yeah. if you were strong enough what would you hear yourself say yeah if they could hear you the way you mean for if you could go home and say to your mother whatever you need to say to your mother and she could hear you the way you want her to what would she hear yeah so then they will start talking and you can pick words out of what they're saying and help them then create their own script that's coming out of them and not out of you mm-hmm. and there's no question that what you are proposing is an open-ended question and then that sparks yeah. insight and and you know the the client developing their own answer and their own solution you know i just am wondering if there ever is a benefit from giving that client that pillar to, to try and, or, or even a life preserver to try and buoy them up. I, I don't know that we're saying different things, uh, but I think it's really important for you to be a genuine person. Yeah. Uh, if you're sad, cry. Um, I can't cry with my client. You know, if it's a sad story and it makes yeah. you cry, cry. Yeah. If it makes you angry, be angry. But say to them carefully, mm-hmm. I'm not angry with you. I'm angry with the person that hurt you. I'm mm-hmm. angry with this circumstance in your life. Not angry with you. Yeah. Uh, and if it's funny, laugh. You think that's funny? Yeah, excellent idea. <laughs> I'm that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're real, if you have a safe holding environment, if you do good, accurate, reflective listening, you can help them mm-hmm. because you hold up a mirror in a safe place for them to look at and try on new outfits mm-hmm. to see if they want to wear a different suit of clothes home, armor, mm-hmm. skills, knowledge, whatever. So. Just to wrap this all up, we are in relationships with people we love for reasons. Or people we're told that we love. Yeah. Yeah. You may not feel it. Whether we're conscious of those reasons or not. Yeah. And so just because you're in a relationship that feels like it's you guys hurt each other all the time that doesn't automatically mean that you don't love that person or that it isn't a loving no it may be the way that you learn to ask for intimacy let's have makeup sex right because then i can really let myself go right Uh, otherwise i'm too constrained by the the raisin that i have but if you want to change that dynamic between yourself and your partner, you have to recognize that that throws the system out of balance, yes, out of home absolutely. Spaces. absolutely. And that's going to be your responsibility to yeah. accept the responsibility and, and of that. Invite them then to move with mm-hmm. you into a new arena. Right. And if they won't, you have to accept that as their reality. Yeah. Even if that, I mean, and I don't, again, we're talking about the economics of the relationship. Even if that means that the relationship ends. So if somebody were to say to me, is it better for me 
to learn these things and get healthy myself yeah. and lose the relationship, my answer would be yes. Well, um, I, I agree with that. I, I just have to be careful about uh, amputations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you've got to be ready. you got to have a plan. you got to know where you're going to go. you got to know what you're going to do. you got to know why you're choosing that. you got to know what it's going to cost. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can't just say, well, I'm all better now. I'm going to get a divorce. Nah, go slow. Just well, go slow. no, no, no. You still have to do the work. I mean, if you, if, yeah. what I'm saying is if someone's asking. Yeah, because if you do, if you just say, I'm going to divorce you because you're right. drunk, I'm going to go out and find you're gonna another find, drunk. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Okay. Hopefully that was beneficial for people. And if you want to get a hold of us, you can reach us through psychwithmike.com. We are really encouraging people to go to Facebook and find us at Psych with Mike. But most importantly, go to YouTube and iTunes. Find Psych with Mike on those platforms and subscribe to us and leave us a comment. That is so, so helpful for us. And several hundred of your closest friends have already done that. Absolutely. And the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.